You're listening to Tapestry, a podcast by a music lover for a music lover. I'm your host, Kelly. Join me as I learn about the common thread that weaves throughout our lives, music. Side note, Tapestry is an uncensored podcast. Don't say I didn't warn you. Welcome to episode 35 of Tapestry, where Evan Carson, the composer of my album of the year in 2019, allowed me to pick his brain about being a professional percussionist. We discuss his epic genre-bending debut album from last year, Akapinski, which retraces his grandfather's journey across Europe and his involvement with the Polish resistance movement during World War II. We also talked about the differences in his practice routines and habits when he's playing and touring with Russian progressive rock duo I Am The Morning, versus touring and playing festivals across the UK with award-winning British folk act Sam Kelly and the Lost Boys, and on overcoming imposter syndrome, the misconception that percussionists can't compose, and working towards his strengths as a musician. I also wanted to give a special shout out up front to Stephen Forrestal, who is someone I know from the Images and Words Prague Discord, and he specifically helped me get this interview set up. Stephen is starting a project called Empire Bathtub, which I would encourage you to check out. I will drop links in all the show notes and stuff below so you can go like his pages everywhere. But my relation to him is that he is also a reviewer for a very cool website that's been supportive of me as well called The Progressive Subway. So Steven's been writing and doing some reviews for them, and he had been the one to reach out to Evan, and knowing that I was a big fan, asked me if I would be interested in interviewing him, and of course I left at the opportunity. So he was able to get me in touch with Evan, and things went extremely smoothly. So thanks again, Steven, and I really hope you enjoy the interview. So without further ado, here's a little bit of the track Otriad off Evan Carson's latest album, Akapinski. Yeah, well, my name is Evan Carson. I'm a percussionist from the UK, um, primarily um, on the folk on the folk scene over here, but have um, always always loved a bit of prog and a bit of metal and stuff. I was brought up on all that kind of stuff as well. Um, I play drums and percussion for a band called Sam Kelly and the Lost Boys over here, which is a combination of um english scottish and irish music and american music um i also play for a band called i'm the morning from russia who um hopefully some of your listeners will probably be more likely to know um from some of their stuff on in the prog world and i also play in the west end on a show called come from away uh so yeah that's just a couple of the things that i do but it, uh, it all it all keeps me pretty busy yeah, like I was saying, your um your resume is a little daunting, I guess. I was just, you know, researching all these names and just looking at the people you play with and seeing some of the shows you've been in. And um, as a fellow as a fellow drummer, I just want to know how you carry everything, where you store everything, <laughs> how annoying it is taking your gear to and from. But um, I guess I'm trying to think of a good place to start. So how long have you been playing drums? And was that always the instrument that you wanted to play? Or did you sort of fall into it? Yeah, I, well, I've been, I've been playing probably for about 20 years, or at least I started learning, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Um, But I've only really been playing professionally for about 10 years at this point, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's it's um it's funny because i yeah in answer to your other question i i've always been a drummer i think that was always the thing that i wanted to do um and that's what i've always done i think i i can't really remember a time when i you know i can't remember a time when i didn't want to drum 
and I guess I was I was one of those people who'd always just be hitting and tapping things I was a bit <laughs> of a bit of a fidgety kid so I think it was inevitable that I was gonna grow up uh doing the same thing did, did you have the phase where you were banging on pots and pans and oh as yeah a kid? okay yeah first <laughs> first first drum set was a biscuit tin and some knitting needles that was um <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that's a common thing uh, that I've found out from a lot of drummers over here. And a lot of drummers that I know and work with, we all we all grew up with the biscuit tin drum kit to begin with. Hmm. So yeah, so you've really been studying for a long time. It sounds like actually. Uh, <laughs> now it, it is. I I wanted to talk to you mostly because well, one I I have to say you know your your 2019 debut album. Am I saying this correctly, Okapinski? Right. Yeah, Okapinski. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Uh definitely my album of the year and I just found it so endearing the way that you could pull in all these musical influences and create something that to me was just um just an exceptionally emotional and human album and as I was listening to it again in preparation for this I was thinking okay so other than just the storyline but what about it musically makes it that way and part of me kind of felt like it has to be just that folk element to it there's a, a sort of um i guess just rawness to the instruments you chose that maybe speak to some kind of primal connection we all have with just a beating drum and maybe a scratchy bow and string i don't know what it is but that kind of human connection is something that i maybe feel like is lacking sometimes in the stuff i listen to and maybe that's why i was drawn to it so much but um, turning this into a question from a statement, I guess, how did you come to that folk side of drums? Because when a lot of people hear, oh, you know, I, I'm a professional drummer, I think their mind might go towards, okay, I'm just playing boom, boom, bat on a hi-hat and a kick, and I play in some rock band somewhere. How did you start going down this folk avenue, and what was it about these other instruments and things that really drew you to them? Oh well, well. First of all, th I'm really glad that you like the album. First and foremost, yeah, that's uh, that's <laughs> like when when I was making it, it really was one of those things where it was. Uh, most people are probably going to hate this, and, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's I'm I'm still kind of shocked by the positive response that it's had so far, and it, it it's it's um, the fact that people like listening to it or that it resonates with some people is like, that's a real bonus. Cause it was a lot of fun to make. Um, so no, I'm really glad you, I'm really glad you like it. Um, I, I guess with, with the, the folk side of things, I guess, and, and we're drumming in, in, in general, it's, I guess, go with what you know. And, um, uh, the, the folk thing really comes from, uh, I've, I've always been fascinated with, with, um, music and instruments from different cultures uh and when i was first learning to play drums i i i i did i did learn on the drum kit but first um i came to it from a, a percussionist who i still i still know and work with um called damien manning who's a, a phenomenal percussionist um who's mainly main sort of skill set is based around samba traditional brazilian samba um and that, you know not just the sort of you know uh, what you see a lot of people doing in a, in a street parade or something but like the real the real brazilian um songs and I, so i came to drumming from a, a slightly more um left of field place and and when i went to university i was learning to play pop stuff you know that was what my degree was based on it was like learning how to play you know just your sort of classic money beat um pop skills which is great but um to, to get any real work you had to be doing something a little bit different and the people i was playing with were all incredible musicians from that sort of scene um and so i sort of came into the folk scene pretty late in the game um but that's where for me, uh, that, that that was the music that was really starting to resonate with me at the time. And so basically from university onwards, I was playing folk music in some way, shape or form and learning to play slightly more traditional instruments like the bow on and stuff like that. So when, when it came time to doing the album, 
I I mainly been playing folk music like solid solidly um and so that instrumentation the slightly more stripped back acoustic sounds were definitely what I had in my head when I was writing a lot of the stuff but at the same time I do also listen to a lot of quite heavily produced music from different styles you know I've always been a huge fan of of a lot of metal stuff always used to listen to Opeth and 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 uh like periphery and bands like that mm. it was always the other side of things like a lot of Devon Townsend and Strapping Young Lad and things just to sort of level out the playing field <laughs> and um and so I've always had that I've still had that kind of production in my head even though I've been using more traditional acoustic instruments I still wanted it, wanted it to have that slightly slicker sound but as we were making the record it sort of became obvious that it was going to be a little bit more raw I guess you could say I hate using that word but um yeah it was always going to be based more around the instruments that I and my friends played which was stuff like the Bauron and piano and viola and stuff like that rather than your like keyboards and electric guitar and stuff though there is a little bit of that in there because I sort of have a bit of a um quarter life crisis of being wanting to be a rock <laughs> a rock star at the same time so <laughs> towards the end of the process we were like ah fuck it let's put some seven string guitar on this as well it's got <laughs> it's got accordion and and piano on it but fuck it let's put seven string guitar on it and uh let's let's just do something really stupid with it and and i kind of like that well, <laughs> so it's uh, yeah i mean okay so i actually have an interesting takeaway from what you just said. You know, you said, I really hate the term raw. And um, <laughs> all that's going through my head is Gordon Ramsay right now, but it's fucking uh, raw. But uh, <laughs> yeah, raw kind of implies that it's somehow worse or it's undeveloped maybe. And uh, as I was listening to some of these other acts that you've been playing with leading up to this, I was thinking, okay, if that's raw, then why is that the song that's like making me cry because it's just so beautiful? It doesn't just because it's stripped back doesn't mean it's lesser than and i think that quality is what really gripped me about your album it's like it's so full and rich and just has all these sonic layers and textures but by no means is it overproduced um uh, and well uh, josh josh the guy who produced it will be really happy you said that because <laughs> he is very much of that mindset he doesn't like to sort of overcook things i guess well, uh, so he'll be happy with that yeah, I went back and and looked at the Kickstarter page you had for it and I'm oh plus on the Bandcamp page I'm just reading down the list of some of the instruments that you had on this album and some of them I don't even know if I'm pronouncing correctly. I know you mentioned the the Baron, the that Irish frame drum you play, but then you have zither, cello, melodeon, all these things that I as a well-traveled music geek, I've heard of many of them but not all of them. So, um when you were kind of building the story for this album and just beginning the whole process, did you imagine that you were going to have so many things all at once or did you sort of start with a core idea and just it built from, you know, it built from there? Uh, well, it, uh, it's, it's, um, it's strange because I, I wrote a lot of this, a lot of the music for the album before the story was really in place. And then, and then um, when we did finally work out the story it, it everything started to um like inform the other elements so um you know when i first wrote it it was a bit of a vanity project of oh look at me i can play in 2516 and <laughs> ha, 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 i can do all this stuff and lots of like angular arpeggios and horrible things on on that i had to get everyone to play and it was a bit of a like i don't know like it was quite therapeutic because a lot of the stuff i've been playing up to that point i couldn't really do those things um uh, and it was a sort of a chance to i guess just to get that out of my system and i definitely feel like i've got that out of my system now hmm. um but i didn't want to put it out if it was just going to be that because i i really i really i really love quite complex music you know that's meant to be you know played by sort of very hardcore virtuosos and stuff but yeah. I don't know I just 
uh, something about it d didn't didn't feel right at that point. And then when we finally did work out what the story was, and when we did find out a little bit more about my granddad and and um, and sort of all the questions that sort of came out of of sort of finding out a bit more about him after he died, um, I suddenly realised that there was there was some sort of substance. Uh, to 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 that and i thought right well i've got all this music and we've got a cool story so let's put it together in some way and it started to feel less like a vanity project and actually like a legitimate album or topic to to sing about um and i and again it was one of those things where i i i, I worked with the instruments that i had at the time and because a lot of the instruments um especially from charlie who plays pretty much every instrument on the planet, I think <laughs> um, guys like him and 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 Toby Cher, who played a lot of the whistles and and stuff, they're really good at um, sort of tapping into different cultures and different parts of the world. And all of a sudden, that we had this this core I idea with a slightly more folk and Eastern European themed sort of uh, instrumentation. And all of a sudden, it all started to feel like something that was meant to be i guess uh that so was quite a, a, a rambling rambling answer to that no but. that's a, that's a great answer um and i think maybe i'm drawn to it as well as a history lover because i think you know in the style of music that maybe you and i both listen to um it, not folk so much but the metal side of things the progressive side of things the the only band that comes to mind other than the band 1914 if you've heard them is Sabaton, like in terms of bands who are explicitly producing music yeah. with a historical storyline. And I love those guys. They're so funny. Like it's like it's definitely not subtle. No. Uh and <laughs> it's it's I love but I love a bit of cheese. I love a bit of cheesy metal music. It's great. And I think the Sabaton and, and Nightwish and a lot of these bands that sort of do that thing. I, I really admire because you've got to have some real confidence to be able to pull that off without looking like a complete twat. And <laughs> I, yes. I, 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 like they've got so much prowess in, uh, when they come on stage and they do that stuff. And you're like, yeah, I, I can buy this. And it's funny that uh, after finishing the album, um, a friend of mine sent me a music video that I think it was a Sabaton one or something. And we both sat there and went, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> but we both sat there with big grins on our faces. So we were like, yeah, this is great. So, but yeah, there is, there is some stuff out there, which um, I've always been a bit of a, like a history geek and a bit of a, a history buff. Um, and so there's definitely something about that, that appeals to me. And so, um, Again, it's part of the folk tradition as well as you know the the a big part of the folk idea is is the the passing down of stories and the uh, the sort of um, the passing on of traditions and keeping traditions and languages and cultures and stories alive, um, and that it felt like a cool way of um, of actually being able to do that you know pl playing playing music that sort of blended prog and folk stuff together with a fundamentally folk mentality because you know we found out a lot of a lot of stuff uh, as we went on and you know a lot of the songs are about very different things you know it's not it's not technically all about my grandfather because there are still so many things we don't know about his his story and so when we came to any sort of like brick walls with finding out stuff about that, we we started to look into other people's stories. And and all of a sudden we had like 10 like unbelievable things that we wanted to pick from. And we had to like try and pick and choose some of the the people and events that we were going to try and talk about in the in the album. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I guess let's let's use that as a, a little place to stop and go um a little bit further into just the research process and for any of my listeners out there yeah we are talking about your your debut album from last year Akopinski and can you just give everyone sort of a primer on 
you know, the album name, what it means, who it's about, and then, because I'm curious as well, I know on the surface level it's about the Polish resistance movement in the Second World War, but that's about where it ends. So I wanted to hear it from you, kind of how you started the researching process and how it eventually came to be what it is now. Cool. Uh, yeah, so it's it's called Okopinski, which is my original family name before it was Carson. And it's the album, as you've said, yeah, it's 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 based around stories and events uh, to do with the Polish resistance, but not just the Polish re resistance. It's got elements from the French resistance, the Maquis and uh, uh, some of the Russian partisan groups and the Jewish um, partisan groups and stuff all kind of dotted in between elements of a story that we started to put together about my granddad because we didn't know very much about him. He was always a very stoic, quiet um, sort of statue of a guy, you know, he never really, he never really talked about his, his, his past. Um, and he was quite distant with us and we didn't have the, the most incredible relationship in the world. But when he died, it, he died in a, in a manner that was, you know, not so dignified when you get to old age and dementia and stuff. And it felt wrong that someone who had clearly been through a lot in their life, in their life and, and, um, and sort of been through all of the things that he clearly had been through, which sort of was going to go out sort of in a pretty naff way. Um, and so we thought, right, well, we want to try and find, we want to try and pay tribute to him and people like him who have gone through the same thing. So yeah, it's about my granddad who, when he was very, very young, uh, became separated from his family in, in Poland when the Germans occupied it and somehow managed to find himself uh, traveling across Europe escaping Poland and eventually spending some time with the French resistance and then joining up with the Polish Navy after um, the Normandy landings. And then he served the rest of the war out with the Poles and then eventually came to the UK where he changed his name because apparently we're a big island of racists and that hasn't <laughs> changed. That hasn't <laughs> changed either. Um, <laughs> controversial, but it's true. Um, so... Yeah, and, but there were so many holes in the story that it was, I didn't want to make up this, I didn't want to make up anything that sort of turned him into like a, you know, like, uh, more of a hero than he was. Because, you know, just the fact that he was a kid who survived all that makes him a hero in my eyes. But, you know, he did not single-handedly -handed, fight Hitler, you know, that wasn't the sort of thing that this was. So we wanted to find other stories of, of the Poles and uh, of the resistance movement um, because the Poles historically have always had a pretty shitty hand dealt to them uh, uh, as, a, as a country that has been occupied, invaded, and just sort of used by lots of other countries. And so we wanted to pay, pay tribute to that, really, and that's kind of what the album's about. That's... Um, yeah, little bits of a biography, sort of like a pseudo biography for my granddad, and then just for lots of other things that we sort of found along the way. That that was a question I had was how much of the story is sort of embellished with little fictional twists, or uh, you know, it sounds like like you just said you were trying not to kind of imbue him with this hubris that he maybe I don't want to say didn't deserve, but you don't want to make him out to be this larger than life figure yet. The, to me, the lyrics are extremely heroic and inspiring, but it doesn't sound like it's aggrandized, you know? It, I wasn't sure how much of that is just kind of filled in or not. <laughs> uh, I, it's definitely filled in to, to a degree, but it's more, it's, I guess it's more speculative than anything because we had these, uh, there were elements of the journey that we knew happened. So we knew where he started. We kind of know where he where he was and where he ended up. Um, and so we spent a lot of time looking at old old pictures and the very few things that he had written down about his time. And we, would, we basically tried to put together a, a vague 
narrative for what he would have been through and then looking at examples of other people who had, who had been through that and documented it more we sort of tried to put something together um so th- there's nothing there's nothing like untrue or created about it um but any t- like i said any time we sort of came up against a, a an unknown element then we would switch to something else um and we tried to sort of like dot those things in between the story uh so yeah when 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 we when we couldn't find out a particular thing about him we'd we'd look at um someone else and and sort of uh, try and try and uh shift the focus to someone else so it became more of like a chronicle of not just him but of other people as well and that sort of felt like a slightly more um fair way of doing it yeah and as an album you're right it it does kind of speak to multiple players in the game but then i think it's sort of interesting how in the real world it actually mirrors that because your list of collaborators on the album is humongous and i was going to ask you about that just what were some of the challenges in actually creating the physical recording for all of this because you just had (laughs) so many people in one room, but then not to mention you also had two collaborators that many of my listeners would know, Jim Gray from Caligula's Horse and then Gleb Dean from I'm the Morning. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're in Australia and Russia. They are, yeah. (laughs) You're Um, kind of stretching a very, very wide, uh, wide area here. Yeah, I, that that is the great thing about one the folk scene and two the internet is that I've I've met so many people along the way so far um, that I just I just had to play with or or have on a recording. You know, as these songs came together, it was like I've got to have that person for that bit. I've got to have that that person for this section, um, and. You know, I've been very, very lucky with 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 playing in Eye in the Morning and playing with Gleb and guys and, and like playing with Gleb and Mariana um, in Eye in the Morning has allowed me to meet so many people who I, I really admire um, and and actually get to work with because I was a big fan of Jim. As soon as I heard Jim's voice the first time live, because I didn't I didn't listen to it before I I, oh, I, wow. I saw it and we were doing a festival in the Netherlands uh and Calig- it was, I think it was Caligula's first European show at that point mm. that they'd ever done. And we were playing in this like cave in, 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 in the Netherlands. And I was just setting my stuff up and, and they just kicked in with, uh, oh, what track was it? Bloom or something. It was, it was, it was a fucking really heavy, chunky track. And yeah. the minute that he started singing, I was just like, holy shit, who is this guy? <laughs> Because it was, it, you know, there's a lot of bands where the vocalists can't always pull the stuff off live. And this this dude was knocking it out of the park, you know, it was incredible. Uh, and, you know, we sat in the hotel bar afterwards and we were chatting. And then maybe a few, it was a few months later when I had written, written a track where I thought, ah, oh, do you know what, it's, it's going to have to be Jim. Because there's there's no one who quite has that um, that sort of energy and passion about what they're doing. Uh, so I thought, right, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna have to be him. And it was the same with Gleb. The, the the from the moment that I met Gleb, I knew that he was gonna be an integral part of the album. And it was funny what you were saying about you know that you know them being in in far away places, but in in reality, Gleb and Jim were the pieces that fell into place the easiest. And working with both of them kind of made the rest of the process a little easier in some ways, but also spoiled me because I sort of came to it. <laughs> I came to expect that of everyone who was on board with it. And obviously everyone is different and everyone's work methods of work and timetables are slightly different. So when it came to working with a lot of the other people, um, you know, everybody really put the time and the work in and I'm incredibly grateful to everyone for, you know, everything that they put into it because i asked a lot of people um and didn't really give them huge amounts back to be honest but i (laughs) I guess i owe i owe them a lot of favors and i'm yeah i'm really grateful but you know jim jim and and gleb both were constantly 
sending ideas and stuff back and a huge amount of the album was co-written with Gleb because I would come up with the, I had the ideas initially for guitar and banjo originally. It was going to be, there's going to be a lot of banjo on this album and there ended up being no banjo, which is make of that what you will. Um, and uh, we, we were at a, we were at a, a studio making uh, a, D, uh, a DVD for Iron in the Morning in Norway and Gleb just started playing one of the pieces that I'd written on the piano. And I was like, fuck, that's it. Right. It's, it's going to have to be that. And so the whole album tone shifted to being Bauer on piano and, and strings, because that's, that's who was there. And all of those guys worked really hard. Carl, who did all of the strings for it, all the viola and violin parts is just a wonderful human being. And he, was on tour with another band and was like recording his parts in hotel rooms and sending them back and stuff like that. And Gleb was tracking things in St. Petersburg and Jim was uh, doing stuff in Australia and just sending things back constantly. And it, it, it was amazing. And I've, I've never known, I've never known a process to work that smoothly. Well, you just answered my next question, which was going to be sort of what was the methodology and the process for just simply collecting everyone's parts and uh i'm sort of imagining the writing of this album now is like this layered cake like you're kind of composing the thoughts and the ideas maybe and building the story around it and then everyone's just kind of going oh well i'm gonna put this little icing here and this little sprinkle here and and then yeah you as the composer sort of um you know, you you become the ultimate say on whether or not you like that flavor or not, and then either get rid of it, start again, or yep, sounds great, keep moving. Um, was it difficult trying to write these other parts then from a percussionist's framework? Like that's what's always astounding to me is when, oh yeah, if if you're a guy that hits things for a living, that you can have such a musical aspect towards it and just be able to conceptualize these parts without maybe necessarily yourself sitting down at a piano to play them or something yeah that is definitely a lot of that and that is one of those things that you know don't ever let anyone if you're a drummer don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't be a songwriter or that there isn't that melodic element to what you do because that's completely fucking wrong you know we we it's we all we all have that element to us and i've i've been lucky enough that I've, I've i've worked with people who are awesome songwriters for a long time and you you end up in studios or in rehearsal spaces and it's impossible for that stuff not to rub off on you a little bit um so the the the, the songwriting process or the idea of arranging strings and different elements for a band i kind of had a little bit of an idea but yeah, you're right. I'm a, I, I, I know drums first and foremost. Um, so I would, I would create these ideas and then I'd have to wait for the person who was going to play the part to tell me whether it was possible or not. Yeah. And there were a lot of times where I, Graham who played the cello was like, yeah, this part isn't actually physically possible on a cello. <laughs> I'd be like, ah, oh, shit, sorry about that. And then he would just send it back anyway. And he'd somehow done it. That was always the thing that, oh. um, everyone on this stepped up you know uh carl created these incredible string sections i would give him like the most chaotic midi map of stuff and he would turn it into these proper orchestrated string sections and it was the same with gleb i would send things over that i don't know how it works like uh and and he would send it back and he had played it and wow. and it, it's stuff like that and jim would send me back ideas on on, on the lyrics and, and the flow and, and how certain consonants and certain elements of sibilance don't work. And yeah, I learned a lot from doing that. So I'm hoping that come album two, I can sort of employ a little bit more um, of an understanding of, of, of different people's instruments. And, you know, it's st stuff like that. There was never really an element or a time when someone would say, no, it, it would always be you've, you've written that like a complete and utter dickhead, but <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. And then it sounds great. And it's like, yay, this right. is cool. Being but, a dickhead um, pays off. <laughs> it does. It can do from time to time. But again, now, now I've learned it. I've learned a lot doing it. So, um, 
that's yeah, that's unbelievable. Cool. That really is that you produce such an amazing album and half of the stuff you're like, I, I don't know if this is going to work or not. But uh, yeah, it did. well, I, I mean, special mention must go to uh, Georgia Lewis, who who um, who did it does a is is probably the main voice on the album. Um, and she's she's a she's a, a folk singer over here uh, who lives in the southwest in Bristol. And she is she is one of the few vocalists I've worked with, aside from Jim, who has entered into the spirit of it and really just been like, yeah, let's really go for this. Let's really sit down and think about it and, and had the patience to sit with me and sort of work, work, take my parts and work it out. And I would sort of travel down to her place and we would spend a few weekends just messing around with ideas and, and, and spending like hours and hours and hours on stuff that would either work or wouldn't work um but i'd always i'd listen to vocalists like uh spencer from periphery and casey from the deer hunters another really good example i was rinsing the acts the act series of deer hunter cds at the time and there's just so much multi-layered vocal arrangements going on and like all you can really hear is the main line but then when you actually really strip it back there's so many other things going on underneath it and I wanted to work with vocalists who were happy to sit and spend that time on it you know like do loads of overdubbing and whisper tracks and 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 really stupid harmonies and and silly voices and stuff and all of these things that I've heard and got ah no that could work really well and I was really lucky that Georgia was one of the people who just sat down and went, Let, yeah, let's do this. Let's really go to town with it. So I'm, I'm really lucky that she sort of wanted to put in the same sort of time as, as I did on it. Well, well, I can thank everyone that worked on your album then because the, the end product was clearly fantastic. And I was just going to say it was fantastic enough to land you a spot in Prague magazine in the issue with Camel on the front cover, no less. So, Oh yeah. Um, that's a, that's a great were, cover. I like that one. Were you, were you pretty geeked about that? I was, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because up until that point, it, it felt like, um, I, I'd, I'd been involved with CDs or bands that had been in Prague quite a lot. Um, so it felt kind of strange when 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 that came along and all of a sudden it was specifically about about my album but it, it only came about because um I'd sent it to uh Nelly who works on the merch uh, a great merchandise site called the Merch Desk over here in the UK she's awesome and she's always been a firm sort of champion of me and and the bands that I've worked with uh and she had it on in the car when she went to pick up the editor of prog magazine who up until that point i don't think knew i existed uh and and then sort of organized the the interview and stuff so yeah uh, it's really cool to have those kind of things i i really like it but at the same time it feels really weird <laughs> well i'm i'm sure it also then probably feels weird for you knowing that um we'll kind of shift gears to i am the morning at this point but on their ocean sounds recording you um, I mean, you got to play with Jordan Rudess from Dream Theater and Gavin Harrison, just legendary. I mean, th you've touched uh, like albums that so many other prog music legends have. And I mean, that just has to feel so fulfilling. Like <laughs> what, what has it been like getting to work with just people of that caliber? And how has it sort of inspired you as a working musician? Ah, uh, it, it, it's pretty mad. I've got to say, like, it's it's funny though because again, the nature of the way that it's recorded is, you know, you're 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 in a studio in the UK doing your parts at the same time as someone is is on the other side of the country or the other side of the world recording their parts. And with I in the morning, like, thank fuck they had Gavin Harrison to do the drum kit parts because, like, I don't think I would have been able to sit and write something or even play something like that. And you know, just I spent a long time even just trying to learn the bare bones of Gavin's parts for when we did the live versions. Right. And it was fucking terrifying. Like <laughs> he is absolutely incredible. But we've never met and he doesn't know who I am, which is fine. Um he might. <laughs> and and it's one of those things where again it's the same with like Jordan Rudis and all these people, is that it's weird hearing your instruments laid against what they're doing but you've never been in the same room really, or you've never really 
connected with each other musically it's it, that's the strange thing about i guess you know modern music production is you can have people uh playing music with each other who yeah who don't who have never you know set eyes on each other or, or spoken to each other let alone played together um but it's a real honor like hearing my stupid little percussion parts like layered over Gavin and Nick Beggs and Mariana and Gleb and stuff. It's it's really scary. It's but it's really cool and it really makes you up your game. That's the that's the one thing that I I've sort of taken away from all of this is that as soon as I was recording some of the Eye in the Morning stuff and some of Gleb's solo album as well. And all of a sudden I had the solo stems for Gavin's drum kit. And I just sat there for hours just listening to just like what he does on his own, just going, oh, my God, like, how am I meant to play anything over this? You know, <laughs> it, 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 it felt strange. And Gavin is one of those players who's very melodic and and filled all of the parts that I'd kind of tagged for myself, which was kind of funny because it meant that I had to sort of sit down and rethink everything that. Uh, I was going to record, but it's great because it then it challenges you to do something a little bit different. Um, but just hearing those parts, like hearing Jordan's parts or Gavin's parts, um, really makes you sit down and think about what you're going to play and how you're going to play it. Um, and I guess it makes you sort of work to your strengths a little bit. And you, you don't always have a huge amount of time to nail these parts. So you really have to go, right, what am I good at? Or what am I good at ish? Uh, and can I do that? Will that work on this? Is that the right thing for the track? Is that the right thing for the song? And there are elements on 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 all those CDs where, to my to my to my ears, it it wasn't your sort of traditional drum kit and bass guitar and rock band arrangement. It was something a little bit more sparse and. I, I really enjoy creating those layers and playing slightly more acoustic sounds and creating more of a soundscape. And there are elements on the albums where I got to do a lot of that. Um, and then you'd get Gavin's kit over the top of it. And it was like, this is fucking cool. This is really, really cool. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly confused and, and thankful to be a part of that. And, and to get to play those parts live is, is, is really scary that's a scary thing because as we know a lot of prog people and especially when it comes to people like drummers like gavin harrison and and, and people like that people are very very passionate and strong-minded about those guys um like another drummer who i do have the pleasure of knowing um is is craig craig blundell who does pretty oh, much frost everything Oh, Frost, uh, down straight, Frost. Fucking love, love Frost. I love Craig Blundell. He, I, is he a wonderful human being? Because he's a wonderful he drummer. Is, they all are. All of the Frost, all of the Frost chaps are, are just the nicest people in the world. Uh, but Craig is probably the nicest human being I've met and has been very complimentary and supportive and has always been very, very kind. Um, and... I mean, he is an incredible player. Let's let's not let's not fuck about with that. But <laughs> his his um, it's his attitude, his his ethos and his approach to to what he does is is probably the most inspiring thing out of any musician that I've come across in a long time. And you know, when he did the Stephen Wilson stuff, you know, he was getting a lot of shit from from people who, you know, obviously that. idolize Gavin. And he had to work through all of that. And I, I'm, I, I'm not saying that I've been through anything to the same scale, but I have had a lot of people coming up to me at, at Eye in the Morning gigs, and they're sort of saying that they're disappointed that uh, it wasn't Gavin. Oh, come on. And, and it's like, that, that's fine. That's cool. You know, um, I, I had a guy come up to me at one of the gigs. Uh, I think he travelled from a very... I think it traveled from a very far away place to come and see the gig. And he just ran up to me after the gig and just pointed at me and was like, you're not Gavin Harrison. And I was like, no, <laughs> I am not. And you could see him. Um, I think he thought 
you know, I'm very flattered to think that maybe he thought I was for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and when he realized I didn't just sort of disappeared and went away to something else. But, you know, there's been times when people have been like, oh, it's a shame that you couldn't get Gavin for this gig and stuff. And it's like, that. I'm, oh. honestly, I am cool with that because he is a monster player and he's incredible. And I'm just lucky enough to be playing this music. Yeah, um, but still, I mean, that's, that almost has to give you some kind of sense of, like, imposter syndrome. Like, well, they just picked me because... Oh, totally. I am him. I mean... Way out of my depth mm. on all this. I, uh, every time I go on stage with Cleb or any of those guys, I'm thinking, I should not be here. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. Um, and then we just have fun and we do it. And it does force you to... Um, again play to your strengths and you know i'm not a player like gavin as much as i wish i was um i i i do something a little bit different so uh and a lot of the i'm the morning gigs have been a little bit more stripped back so it hasn't needed a, a drum kit in the stereotypical uh uh approach right so it has been you know okay well we, we're going out as a four piece at the moment which is percussion piano vocals and cello um so it's finding ways to make those four elements blend together as fully as they can and sometimes a normal drum kit isn't what you need for that um right and i guess that's sort of um one of the ways that i've been able to take heart when i have read certain comments or people have said certain things it's like yeah yeah i'm not i'm not that dude I'm really not as much as I wish I was. Um, but the fact that people feel so passionately about it is is cool. But again, I'm off on a tangent, but uh, Craig is one of those people who really has just worked through that and, you know, like fair play to him because he's he has had to really sort of crawl through the mud and the trenches to get to where he has. And there is nobody who deserves the sort of success and recognition and fulfillment that I imagine he probably feels um, more than him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just such a funny thing, though, especially in the kind of metal and prog community, like you said, people are really passionate about, uh, maybe it's from the technical side of things, oh, you know, this, they didn't play that right. This isn't, you know, this isn't exactly how it sounds like the album, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I think, like, I don't know if, I don't think they did a tour in the UK, but last year here in the US, the Contortionist did that, I think it was last year, that fantastic tour where they essentially played all of their stuff, but just in this stripped back kind of acoustic reworking of it. And yeah, I almost, that's cool. I almost didn't go to that show. And then I'm so glad I did because it just, brought a whole nother element to the music and so it's unfortunate that you're getting flack for doing exactly what that band is hiring you to do is to bring your you know i need evan carson as a drummer for this tour i don't need gavin harrison for this tour because this is what i'm choosing to have the music sound like and it's unfortunate that a lot of people can't see that distinction that it's like no no, no you're in the right place for the right show for the right music so uh <sighs> The internet's the internet, though. I guess that's just how it is. Um, I am curious, though, how did the relationship with I Am The Morning develop? Because you're nowhere near each other, geographically speaking. Nope, we are certainly not. Um, <laughs> it's uh, It's been a while now. Uh, but many, many, many a year ago, I, I played in a band called Stark uh, when I was at university, which was like a... Um, a blend of prog and like super traditional like um blues so like sort of like skip james and robert johnson meets tool was sort of what we were going for and we played we used to go out and play the shit as gigs um you know we'd like travel from you know where where we lived in brighton to london to play a gig for no you know the, the classic starting out band gigs and we played this cool venue in in soho in london uh and just before we were going to go on, uh, there, there was this, this duo went on stage, which was this, uh, you know, redhead lady with dreadlocks and this very quiet, pale, pale dude on a piano. Um, and they just played the most fucking insane music I'd ever heard at that point and i think it was because it was live and it was just the two of them and we had no idea what we were expecting and we were about to go on and play like 
hoedowns and stuff like that. <laughs> are there, and we thought, who are these guys? Um, and we got chatting to them afterwards. Um, and, you know, we found out, you know, that we had like quite a, a shared sort of like love of particular bands and stuff. And we stayed in touch for a couple of years, just on and off. And then just before they released uh, Lighthouse, Mariana got in touch with me and asked me if I wanted to come and play some some percussion parts on, on Lighthouse. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why at that point, after all that time, they decided that was the right thing to do. Um, but I went in and I did it. And and then very shortly after that, um, was was asked to go and do uh, B-Prog in Barcelona with them. Uh, that that was like my first gig with them, which was a bit of a mind fuck playing with uh, playing with those guys on the same bill as uh, who was it? It was Stephen Wilson, Opeth, Agent Fresco, and a load of other really cool bands. And we were like, "What? Okay, yeah, cool, let's do this." Um, but it, it yeah, it, it it was a really random thing. I can't quite put the whole journey together because it, it it doesn't really make sense but it was just one of those things that it i just sort of woke up one day and it was a thing it was just a thing that yeah you're you're the drummer uh, for i am the morning now and and you know it was it it, it it's really nice because I, I share that i share that sort of seat with another drummer back in back in russia a guy called mikey istatov who is the more he is much, much more like the Gavin style of drumming. He's a really hardcore sort of like chops, gospel chops drummer. And when they're doing their sort of more heavy sets, because they do have these different different styles of Iron in the Morning for when they need to do things, you know, they've got a heavy version with guitars and they've got the stripped back version and they've got a more classical version. And it, it's great because when they do that, they can get those guys in. and it's really fun being able to share that seat with him and we can, you know, we work together every now and then. And I learned a lot of the parts for the Eye in the Morning gigs from Mike's, Mikey's interpretations of Gavin's parts because it was just a slightly more realistic way of learning them. Uh, and then he, he'd sort of taken his own, his own sort of spin on them. So I was able to take that as well. And it was really, really fun. And, yeah, it was just one of those things that overnight you just became involved with this 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 group of unbelievable musicians on the other side of the world. Um, and I yeah, I, I I count myself very very lucky to have them as friends and 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 colleagues. It's it's really awesome. That that is too cool, honestly. Though you've gotten to just sort of fold into that. Now, um, I know a lot of the focus of our conversation has been on the Prague stuff and. That's kind of my bread and butter, but I don't want to neglect all your accomplishments with the folk side of things, too. I know that <clears throat> you've been playing with Sam Kelly and the Lost Boys, and you guys won an award for BBC um, BBC Radio 2 Folk Awards. That's got to be awesome. I know you've played a lot of festivals. And so um, why don't you tell me a little bit more just about some of your experiences playing in all of those styles of bands, and honestly how you just manage your time to be able to do all these things and travel to all these different gigs and practices. Uh, well, I mean, I have a very, um, confusing Google calendar that, uh, <laughs> sort of, sort of gone from being helpful to not being very helpful right now. It's getting a bit mad. Um, the, the folk thing's awesome. I, I love it. Um, uh, it's a very different way of playing you know it's it is like you were saying it's a lot of the time it is very raw and it is very visceral and it is um it is just about people playing in a room together and it's about telling stories and i love that and and i've 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 played music with sam and jamie who's um the guitarist and banjo player in sam's band uh I've, I've played music with them for a long time and I've been lucky enough to sort of just keep going and keep doing it and, you know, go from playing the, the empty pubs and clubs to, where nobody want, there's nobody there to being able to play these really awesome festivals and things and, and to watch Sam grow as a, 
as a songwriter and a producer and a musician has been awesome. Uh, and to sort of be along for the ride with that, you know, through his folk award win. And then we had some nominations with the full band a few years after that, uh, has been great. And we've got to sort of play with the best of, of those worlds and travel to all these places and play in all these different kind of traditions. And we did a lot of stuff in, in other languages, you know, and, and I, I work in a, in a Scottish collaboration called the Tweed project as well, which is a, a combination of English and Scottish musicians. Uh, a lot of it is, um, sung in, in, in Gaelic. Uh, and there's, there's a great, um, sort of shared community in the folk scene that everybody has sort of played with everybody. And, um, you know, we all love the same music and a lot of it is traditional music. So everybody plays it and has their own interpretation. And it's one of those magical times when you can, a lot of the times just walk into a session or a bar and play a piece of music with someone you've never met, but you all know it. And that's the funnest thing that, that really is. And that's one of those things that, you know, doesn't doesn't happen on the prog scene as much. Uh, you know, everything's a little bit more prepared and 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 polished, and it it's a little bit more sociable on the folk scene. But everyone is a shit hot musician, <laughs> and so you have to really really up your game when you're playing with these people, um, and because you're learning music from lots of different styles. Uh, even within the, the sort of genre of folk, there's lots of different subgenres. Um, yeah, it really does keep you on your toes, uh, whether you're playing Scottish, Irish, traditional English, uh, Cornish stuff, American, Breton, anything like that. It's, it's, it's just really inspiring and it's great. And yeah, it does sort of keep my, it keeps my chops up. Yeah. Um, it's, which is which is always useful. It's good to hear you say that because one of my early one of my very early episodes was a good friend of mine from, I mean, primary schooling all the way up through you know middle and high school here, and she and her husband are both bagpipers, and yeah. they they talked about I mean that that entire community they're just so entrenched in it. That's where most of their friends are from. That's where most of their social events are, and uh, I loved talking to them because of that exact sense of community that you just mentioned but even here in the states i mean there are some kind of pop-up scottish faux scottish bars or pubs and that's exactly what they said they said you can just walk in on a wednesday night uh bring whatever you can play and there's someone's gonna know the blarney stone or whatever and like (laughs) you'll be just be able to kind of hop in on it um i just find that fascinating because to me music Really, music is community, and uh, it's it's cool how each little subgenre kind of has its own world. Um, oh, though, totally. I guess describe for me then what what's the environment like at a big folk show? Like, how does the audience and the interaction with the musicians kind of compare to maybe a metal show or a you know prog rock show? Uh, it it it's it's funny that because it it's different depending on where you go. Um, there's always a sense of you know every everyone is there to listen um you know we, we no, you never really get that much heckling or anything but <laughs> everyone is always very uh polite when they're listening but they're also really passionate about it which is great but it depends on where you go because in 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 england it's very much it's a a, a a middle-aged white guy with a beard and a <laughs> jumper and a dog and he's scratching <laughs> he's scratching his chin um and he's and he's waiting for you to sing uh, a song that he knows yeah uh which is probably like a child ballad or something which has like 900 verses or something <laughs> and it's probably about uh, something really horrible uh, and sexist because a lot of a lot of folk music is unfortunately um, not the most um, not the most politically correct anymore. Yeah, maybe a um, little uncouth. Oh yeah, um, but yeah, in England it's a little bit more sit down and listen to it, um, and then probably come up to you afterwards and tell you about what you did wrong. Um, <laughs> but then you go across the border and you go up to Scotland and it's it's mad. It's just um, 
it's so passionate it's so it's more like a metal show you know when when you when you when you get to play some of the venues and some of the festivals and stuff up in scotland it is young people going mental um and it you know there's a, a, a i think it's still going on it might just finish um but there's a festival that happens up in glasgow called celtic connections which is one of the biggest sort of folk music festivals that happens really over here um and you go into a bar or a club venue which you know if you if you if you didn't have if you had your fingers in your ears you would assume that it was probably like disco or like club music like proper <laughs> rave music uh but then it, it's like traditional scottish music is what's pumping out of the musicians on stage and everyone's really drunk and just absolutely going for it and so there's just slightly different uh attitudes to to the music wherever you go um and that for me always makes me laugh because that's quite similar to a lot of the prog scene actually where some shows you can go to and people are going crazy and then you go to some of it and there's just people standing at the front of the notebook you know it's that kind of there's always that element but um yeah it's just it it they all it's very different wherever you go and especially now uh with everything that's going on in the world and stuff it's it's becoming a little bit more politicized again which is you know both good and bad um Mm -hmm. for music you know and it is predominantly young people playing it now um compared to an audience which is maybe a little bit older right yeah i was looking up stuff about sam kelly because i had to listen to some of his tracks and um they were just fantastic it's not any of the music that's normally in my wheelhouse but i really loved it and then i saw isn't he only like 24 or something he's quite young yeah he's uh yeah he is he's in his mid-20s and he's uh yeah he's got he's got motivation yeah i mean do you sort of see yourself in the folk side of things as sort of leading a charge for maybe you know a new english generation of folk or a new scottish generation of folk like it sounds like those clouds are swirling (sighs) you know yeah i mean there's i mean there are so many incredible acts that's the thing that you know and that's one of the great things about this scene is there are so many people leading the charge now and it's nice it's nice to think that we might be considered one of those bands um because you know a lot of us are um for better or for worse english but the the good thing with with sam's band is that you know we've got um you know one of our members is from scotland and we've you know we've got members who who specialize in particular styles of folk music so we sort of are able to bring a lot of things together you know we love our, we love a lot of american stuff and we love a lot of scottish and irish and english things and we try to cherry pick the elements of it that we really like yeah and put it together so it would be nice to think that we're sort of up there doing that as as an in like uh as an english band i guess um but i guess a lot of us consider ourselves british or or european at this point it's a bit of a sore it's a sore point today especially. <laughs> yeah um, i was gonna say I, I went oh god i'm interviewing you like post brexit that's uh... <laughs> it's it's um it's very quiet outside. <laughs> Awful timing yeah. on my part. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's all good. It's nice to talk to people about it. But that's the thing is that, especially now in Scotland and stuff as well, it's like the the music and the identity and the culture is 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 is, is it's it's never lost its fire, but like it's it's really been stoked right now to the point mm-hmm. where people are so passionate and all of the Scottish bands that I know are really really flying the flag and are really sort of fighting i guess to sort of keep their culture and their heritage and stuff alive and that's really inspiring mm-hmm. um and yeah so as with sam's band it's 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 nice to know that we're sort of still a part of that world and we're gonna well, i guess we're gonna try and do our best to sort of you know try and give some some sort of reputation back to english folk music in a way because it's stereotypically the most uncool of the folk styles within the uk <laughs> um, um but yeah it's it's cool that's the magic about it though it's there's there's so many different people playing so many different styles of it yeah no i i was um i, I definitely think just in researching you and, and what you do as a musician um 
I, I would really like to dive into that more because there is something about it. it maybe it's just uh, you kind of get your ears just kind of get tired of hearing similar sounds, listening to primarily one genre all the time, even if everyone's doing things a little bit differently. I just sort of get ear exhaustion sometimes oh, and I have I... to like kind of come up to the surface and go, OK, like this past week, I've been listening to a lot of electronic music. I think I was just getting burnout on guitars and men screaming so i just needed a break and um i i want to dive into this now so um that being said you know you're you're traveling quite a ways to go collaborate with these people and uh you're you're playing in a lot of constantly touring bands what what is a practice session like for you like maybe how do you um stay on your toes as a musician in your home life just practicing at home and then what are your practice routines like when you're out with all these bands? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, I definitely don't practice as much as I should. Um, Said every me, musician ever. <laughs> yeah. I, and anyone who isn't, anyone who says otherwise is, is uh, probably telling some fibs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but for me, it's very goal orientated in that I need something to be working towards. Um, and I'm lucky enough that I'm kept busy enough that, the sort of day-to-day -day craft and skill is sort of kept on top of because I'm constantly playing. Um, you know, if we're if we're out on if we're out on tour, then for me, what I'm doing requires a certain amount of warm-up, which isn't necessarily like doing anything musical, but just like making sure that my joints and stuff are are, are ready to do the to do to do the the job they they need to do because. A lot of a lot of the instruments that I'm playing, um, the movements that the the joints and muscles are making are counterintuitive to something else I'm doing. So you have to constantly be keeping like your wrists and your hands and stuff um, up up to scratch, I guess. Especially yeah. with the bar on, you know, because the, the, when playing the bar on, it's a very different set of movements to when you're using drumsticks. But you know. In mm -hmm. the same show, in the same show, I might be playing baron in one way, or drum kit in another, or be playing other ha pieces of hand percussion. So, it's more just making sure that your your body is physically ready to do it. Um, so that's what it's like on tour. You know, then you get a bit of a chance to, if you've got a good um, routine in place, you can dick about a bit on stage and sound check and just sort of play something fun. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's very much just, I'll, I'll try and wake up in the morning and do a particular thing. I won't just try and sit there and do paradiddles or whatever, though. Sometimes that can be fun. Sometimes it's nice just to stick something on the telly and just do paradiddles for an hour. Right. Uh, but a lot of the time for me, it's if, if I have a particular gig or job that's coming up, then I will work to that specifically. Like it was like that with the eye in the morning stuff the first time. I think it was uh, a couple of weeks before the Barcelona gig that I knew that we were going to be doing this. So I basically locked myself away in a friend's rehearsal studio for a couple of weeks and just sat and, and, and like really like broke down the parts and the arrangements and the melodies to a point where I just sort of knew everything that was going on. Um, and I, I, I had to do a similar thing recently when I started on this uh, this show in the West End called Come From Away. Um, it was a very similar thing of, it's a very sort of physical physical show. So what's written on the score and on the page isn't necessarily accurate to what you're doing. Um, so I had to spend a lot of time reading that and then listening and then going in and, and, and watching the show and then going home and, and just working through each each part individually and it, you know just I, i'm i'm pretty good at basically just doing one thing uh i guess so <laughs> if 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 there's more than one job that's coming up that's when i tend to start to struggle because my time management isn't great um but if i've got something like that that's coming up i'm able to just sort of go okay well for the next two weeks i'm going to shut myself away and do this um, that's kind of what I, what I do, but like, there are definitely, definitely things I could be doing better right now. Well, that being said, what is your best advice for any 
musician who's aiming to do exactly what you do. You are, I mean, I'm, I'm making an assumption here saying, oh, you're living the dream. You're a working musician. You're doing that full time. What's your best advice for people looking to do the same? Uh, just, uh, it's, it's hard to say this without it being very corny or stereotypical because every, everything's been said, I guess, but just do what you want to do. Um, you know, I never imagined that I would be doing what I am doing, let alone sort of able to make a living from doing what I'm doing, uh, playing a very niche set of instruments, uh, in a very particular type of music. Um, but I, I guess I always knew that this is what I wanted to do as a musician. And I've just, I've continued to do it. Um, I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people who have, um, decided that that wasn't for them and that, you know, playing music was their, was their sort of like way of coping with the rest of their lives. And, and for me, it's always just been this, this is what I do. And, you know, practice, stay on top of things as much as you want or as much as you feel you should. So the point, you know, if you're, if you're going to go in and do a session, then you don't want to embarrass yourself by not being able to play the stuff. You need to be physically able to do it. Um, yeah, I guess that does come from, from practice, but I guess also just, just being able to sit and prioritize what you think you want to learn and uh, not necessarily what you should learn, you know, do the things you really want to do and don't be a dick. Like it's <laughs> such an important thing. Cause I, you know, when I first started out, I had a horrible ego, probably still do. Um, and I learned pretty quickly that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're good at, if you're technically good, if, if the rest of the people you're playing with don't like you, then there's, there's a high chance that you're not going to get asked back. And, you know, sometimes you do find that out the hard way. You know, I'm very lucky in the fact that I've never been fired from anything for that. Thank God. But, you know, uh, you know, we're all just, we're all just people trying to play music and I've, I've worked with people who take themselves very, very seriously. And I've worked with people who really don't take themselves seriously at all. But the common denominator that they all have is that they're shit hot when they go on stage and what they do, and what they do as a performance and the way they write songs and the way they go about their work is, is awesome. But there are people who do take themselves very seriously and there are, there are people who know what they're doing but can also do it with a bit of a laugh. And yeah, I would say don't take yourself too seriously. It's just music. We're all very lucky to be doing it, but it is just, it is just people playing music. Um, and, you know, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not a fire, I'm not a firefighter. I'm not any of those things, you know, um, I'm just a guy who gets to hit things and I'm lucky <laughs> enough to be able to do it for a living. And I think it's important to keep that in perspective sometimes because it is very easy to get angry about the fact that you've got to drive hundreds of miles to go and do a gig. And it's very easy to start complaining about the smallest things or about laundry when you're on tour or stuff like that. But all of a sudden, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because I still get to come home and pay my bills being able to play music, which is, you know, dream it really is a dream come true that really yeah. is a dream come true it's just um, it's nice that there are still people out there doing it you know that that it isn't a totally dead goal i mean it really highly depends on what world you're in i think but it's just refreshing to hear that you've been able to adapt and pursue that truthfully yeah i, I mean i i am very lucky and a, a lot of the people i work with as well are very lucky but they've all put the time in to do it as well you know there's there is there's not one person i know who i work with who is not deserving of what they do um and what they what they're getting out of it and that's the really inspiring thing that you're seeing people you're playing with people who are just awesome but they're also someone that you would quite happily sit in a van with for or a bus or a plane or a studio for weeks or months on end and not want to murder by the end of it <laughs> you know that's that's that is a big that is a big part of this as yeah. an industry you know yeah. it's um it is very people focused well before i ask my next question then you said okay i'm not a fireman i'm not a brain surgeon but what 
you are is apparently a duck philanthropist. So I wanted to ask about that. <laughs> That's um, oh god, yeah. This is it's, one of those things. It's that on your website, and I went, yeah. Hmm, what I does that mean? That. Uh, so many many years ago, I'd said that I liked ducks to someone, and then it was one of those things where all of a sudden every every gift or everything you ever get from anyone is duck related <laughs> you're the duck guy now uh i am the duck guy i do like ducks ducks are great because they're ultimately useless they <laughs> they're they're not really very good at anything they don't i mean they can float but they don't walk very well they don't fly very well you know they eat bread and they explode that kind of thing <laughs> and it's just i don't know i've always found them i've uh I spend a lot of time in in the Lake District um, up here in the north of England, um, which is, you know, it's really nice lakes and mountains, and there's just always really nice animals and stuff around. And uh, I, I when I, when I was young, I just sort of gravitated towards them. I think, and it's it's uh, yeah, they've always just been a a, a fun a fun animal in my life. <laughs> just stuck uh, with you. Uh, it, yeah, it really has to the point where it's got out of hand a little bit where everyone's like, here's a duck thing. We know how much you like ducks. I'm like, <laughs> I, I do like ducks. You're right. But I, there are also other things I like as well. <laughs> um, I, I came from, I, I think it was a description that Jem from Frost put on his on his page or a description about the band. He would just put the most nonsensical random things in that had nothing to do with the music. And I... Uh, that really connected with me. So I think that's why I did it. <laughs> well, I'm um, thank you for answering that question. Cause it was killing me. I was like, I have to remember <laughs> to ask him what he means by that. But I think, I think it's more just that, like I, I, it, if you're going to feed ducks, then yeah, really don't feed them bread. Cause it's really mm -hmm. not good for them. Uh, they, they love rice krispies. I don't know. Do you get rice krispies in the U S uh, I yes. guess that is something. Yes. This is uh, an educational podcast. Do not yeah. feed ducks bread. It is extremely bad for their digestive system. This has love, been a public service seeds. announcement. Yeah, they love seeds. They love kale. They love all all the sort of stuff that you definitely wouldn't have in a bag to go and feed them. Right. <laughs> so, I, uh, but yeah, I've I've spent a lot of time at like lakes and rivers telling children not to feed <laughs> ducks bread and then getting shouted at by their parents. It's happened As more that, times than that's going to be count. you like forty years from now. Is just you're the guy. Don't feed the ducks, Fred. Yeah, do it's it. going to be me. It's going to be crazy duck man. <laughs> well, that's a that's great. a great way to segue then. What are your goals for the future? And I imagine one of them is now you're going to be just the cranky old man yelling at kids about not feeding ducks bread. But truthfully yeah. speaking, what what are your goals for the future? And then why don't we talk up uh, talk a little bit just about some of the stuff you're working on. I know you have um, some trio shows coming up with Gleb and uh, Toby Share, and sounds like you're working on getting an Okapinski full band thing together. And uh, yeah. yeah, tell so, me about that. Uh, so yeah, I realize I've been talking for a long time. So anyone still listening to this, well done. Uh, <laughs> and if you're sick of my voice, then don't worry, so am I. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, this is a fun year. This was, um, this is definitely the first year where there's been a little bit more stability um, in terms of, you know, the job really has been just sort of going from, especially last year, um, you know, I spent pretty much six months away nonstop, um, which I know for a lot of people who are touring musicians, they'll be like, oh, that's nothing. But it was it was six months away from thing to thing with 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 no no time uh, to do anything else, really. Um, and that was great. It was awesome, but by the end of it, I was completely burnt out, and you know, my 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 other half, Amy, was was very patient, and and but towards the end of it, really was asking me if that was truly what I wanted to do, and if there was a better way of doing it, and that was the first time that I'd definitely gone, oh yeah, actually, there might be a more sensible way of doing this <laughs> as a job, and luckily, the the, the West End thing came up. Um, and I teach and I've got some other tours and stuff going on, um, which has allowed me to sit down and finish writing album two, which I'm going to slowly start trying to put together this this year, though I don't really know how that... Is it a historical album? No, um, there might be a couple of elements of that. I'm, so, I'm, I'm not going to do another concept album like in the same way that the first one was. And I think I've said pretty much everything that I think should be said about that particular section of history. Yeah. 
uh, there's there's a couple of other things I was writing about. Um, there's you know there's a lot of uh, very interesting attitudes um, and and things happening over in the UK right now that have definitely made me think and write some songs. And the fact that you've got families and relationships that have been ruined by the the sort of the political uh, landscape of what's going on over here right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the first time in, in, you know, in, in my lifetime that I've seen that happen. So, uh, it's kind of depressing seeing everything that's been happening over here. And then you know, obviously over where you guys are and then in the rest of the world. And, um, there was just a couple of conversations I've had with friends who do feel very much the opposite to the way I do. Um, but we've been able to have good conversations about it. And so there's a lot of songs on, on, on the new album that are going to be a little bit more about that, that conversation Interesting. Uh, between, between different attitudes and different people and stuff. Uh, and then there's a couple of other things, but it's uh, going to be a little bit heavier, a bit, uh, a few more sort of traditional sort of instrumental passages in terms of um, taking tunes from like Scottish and Irish music and sort of piling them into the mixture. Um, but a big part of that will be uh, doing stuff with, with Gleb and Toby this year that at the end of the last I in the morning tour, Gleb and I both sat down and went, Hey, let's, let's, let's really do this. Let's, um, let's try and write, let's try and write an album of, of, of just fun instrumental stuff first and foremost that we could gig quite easily. So that we've got, our, we've got our first, trio show in may uh where we're basically just going to be experimenting with stuff that will later go onto an album in the year i think Hmm. that's a that's a cool way to do it you're almost kind of debuting it before it's written i guess you know like feeling it it out it's the first time in a long time that you know we when we were doing the eye in the morning stuff we were we were spending a lot of time sort of adapting songs off the album to be played in a slightly different way and by the end of the tour, you're sort of walking away going, ah, oh, that's actually a really fun version. It would be nice if there was a version of that kicking about. Um, and I feel the same way trying to adapt the Okapinski stuff for so for like some solo shows and doing that with with a trio and a slightly bigger band that there are now other sort of um, versions of these songs that I wish had gone down instead because we've sat and we've sort of rearranged them best for a live show. Uh, and that's kind of fun. So that's yeah. There's this is definitely the year for for just doing a little bit more playing with the intention of it just being a bit of fun, as opposed to having to make every gig count towards your bills and your tax and your <laughs> right. mortgage. Or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's the aim this year. And ju- and to learn a few more things, I've got a few other jobs coming up where I'm having to learn some new instruments and, and, and things. So this is the year to sort of really, uh, just try and learn something new because you're never meant to stop learning. And I feel I definitely need to sort of start playing catch up in a couple of areas. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the plan to, to, to take some of the stuff that we've written recently and gig it and then, and then record some new things and just, just have some fun. Really. I think that's the plan for this year because the rest, the rest of the, the rest of the world is is in a in a pretty shocking place. So I think if we could just have some fun playing some music, that would be good enough for us right now. It it sure seems like it a lot of days, <laughs> to be honest. So that's um that's very exciting. Honestly, I'm uh I'm looking forward to what you come up with next. And oh, thank you. You know, I'll I just hate that an entire ocean separates us. So I probably won't be able to make it to your gig, but you know, you never know. I'll see. Uh. I I keep saying with like Arc Tangent and all these fantastic festivals in the UK coming up over the next couple months, I'm like, I I really need to get a passport. I I really do. There's so <laughs> there's so much fantastic stuff happening in I mean, not even just the rest of Europe, but just just the United Kingdom alone. From an American standpoint, it's like, oh yeah, we get great shows all the time, but then when we don't, they're all over there. So I <laughs> yeah it's, it's I mean we we have a slightly different attitude to it over here I think the fact that um we you know you go to Europe and you play these incredible festivals and then you come back to the UK and just the, what what people are expecting to pay for going to see live music is very very different and and uh, uh within the UK there definitely seems to be a different value put on live music 
uh, compared to the rest of the world. Um, in a, in a good way or a bad way? I, I I would say probably not in a not in a particularly positive way. You know, there's uh, definitely an attitude of people not wanting to pay to to see live music, uh, and there's definitely the value of live shows and and live bands is definitely um sort of being on the down. But hmm. um, it's again with the folk with the folk scene, it's a little bit different because it is primarily about live music. So right. you know. That's good. Interesting. But you know, there's so many great uh, festivals and stuff that I want to go to in the US and and Europe and stuff. And you know, the last time I was in the US was to go and play this uh, this folk expo festival in Kansas City. In the okay. Set, you know, like of all the random places to have a yeah. festival, it's incredible. And it's just I really miss being able to go and do things like that. So yeah, I sort of feel I understand what you're what you're feeling. <laughs> it's uh, it's just such a shame. It just uh, kills me. It's like why can't travel be a little bit less expensive and, you know, barriers to entry, but regardless, well, um, Evan, I've really enjoyed talking with you. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I will leave you with my last question. And that is sure always, thing. um, if you could only choose three albums to listen to for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? Oh man. Oh God. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> See, I, my, my my mind's now gone into overdrive where I'm trying to think of, of different genres and stuff that I would do. Um, Million Town by Frost would definitely be my prog choice, uh, just because when I first heard that album, it, it, it that was the album that made me go, oh, maybe I can write a song too. I don't know. There was just <laughs> something about it. At the, it. It came to me at the right time. Um, oh, God. And then what else have I... What, what, yeah, so uh, Frost, uh, Million Town by Frost. Um, then there's an album called Freedom Fields by a guy over here called Seth Lakeman, uh, who's like a bit of a folk juggernaut. He's pretty awesome. Um, and that was like one of the first sort of like modern production folk albums that I'd heard. And that's that's got some incredible some incredible songs, but some really cool production and songwriting ideas on it. So, yeah, uh, Freedom Fields by Seth Lakeman would be would be the second one. And then I don't know if it's still about, but there was a band from Canada a few years back called Unexpect. Have, have you ever come across them? Oh, they they are they're not around anymore. I don't believe, but I am familiar with their music, and it's very cool. Ah, uh, but their second album, um, I can't I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it's, it has a blue cover. Um, yeah, it's like Fables of a Sleepless Empire or something. Uh, I can't. I'm, I'm gonna look it up right up. now. I know exactly what you're talking about, but um. But that that album was just so insane, uh, like. It, that it's the one just... not on Spotify, but <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. Oh man! Oh, yeah. that, if you can find that album by Unexpect, you know it was all the elements of all the other styles of music I loved growing up, sort of just thrown into a into a blender. It was insane, and the first time I heard that, I was like, "What? What the actual fuck is this?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I, it was an album I bonded um, bonded over with with quite a few friends of mine that I still work with and I remember that album was the album that sort of made me go you can do just about anything in terms of music uh, and in terms of creativity and it was one of those things where if you were frustrated about a song that you were trying to write or a piece of music that you were trying to play not coming together I would listen to that album because the sheer um level of dedication and effort that would have gone into making that mind fuck of an album is just uh it, it, it boggles the mind uh, like how on earth did they start writing that and then record it and then perform it right. so it was quite an inspiring album in the same way that you listen to like a lot of the uh like the cardiacs and uh, bands like that where they were just doing this really insane stuff and right. it, to me, that was really satisfying. Uh, so yeah, so my 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 top three would be uh, Million Time by Frost, Freedom Fields by Seth Lakeman, and whatever that second album by Unexpected, because mm -hmm. it's just wow, what a uh, yeah, what a what a myriad answer there. Yeah, and, and those those are three albums I've probably not listened to for a good couple of years now. 
you know, I've not listened to them, but I, I don't think I could ever do without them. I think those will always be the albums that I come back to. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's exactly what I'm looking for. So, um, Evan, thank you so much for taking the time. And I know it's right in the middle of the afternoon for you, but um, it was just phenomenal chatting with you. It's pretty, um, pretty crazy to think that I get to chat with the person who wrote my favorite album out of the hundreds of albums I listened to last year. So thank you for for spilling the beans and um, just telling me everything about you. So no, real pleasure talking to you. Oh, what a bloke, right? He was just great. As should be abundantly obvious by now, I'm a big fan of Evan's work, and hey, anyone who listens to my show or knows me in person knows that I listen to hundreds and hundreds of albums every year, and the fact that Akapinski came out on top as number one should tell you that you should drop everything you're doing, and instead of hitting next on Spotify or wherever you're listening to Tapestry right now, please go listen to Akapinski. Please support him. I think that this work is just unbelievably great. That being said, please feel free to stay tuned to everything Evan is up to for all of his projects. You can check out his website at evancarsondrums.com. He's at evancarsondrums.bandcamp.com and he is under Evan Carson Drums, unsurprisingly, on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you for listening to episode 35 of Tapestry, and as I started off this episode, I gave a little special shout out to Stephen Forrestal of the Progressive Subway and his project Empire Bathtub. Please check out Empire Bathtub. He's just getting some music released. And you can also go check out what the Progressive Subway is up to at their website, theprogressivesubway.wordpress.com. They're also on Facebook. They are working on some really, really cool prog leaning reviews and interviews. So I'm proud to support them and I am always going to be here for what they're up to next. As always, thanks for listening. 